Assalamualaikum. Uh, Dr. Dahia, uh, you can test the slide first while waiting for the participants. Assalamualaikum. Dengar tak? Sorry. Uh, ya, yeah. dengar. Uh, jelas ke dia dengar bunyi kipas? Jelas. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, I try to present my screen. All of you can see. Is it clear? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Is it in uh, presentation mode? Uh, yeah. Alright, All right, thank you. So, uh, just let me know uh, when I can start, okay? Uh, we will start uh, at 9 Oh, um, I think we will start now. Dah boleh start dah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning I bid to the speaker and all participants. Uh, before we begin our session, let us start with the recitation of Umul Kitab Al-Fatihah. Okay, uh, dear all participants, please uh, fill in the Google form for the start point. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker, uh, Dr. Dahiyah, to start the session. Okay, I have to close already. Okay, thank you. Uh, siapa tadi? Aznira. Uh, Aznira batch mana? Uh, Evan Zua. Evan Zua. So, okay, that for you, eh? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you uh, for inviting me. So first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate all the participants yang ada kat dalam GMIT ni. So nak tanya, uh, mostly in GMIT ni year berapa eh? So, some name are familiar but some are maybe quite new for me. I think um, yang baru naik third year kot eh. Boleh respond tak? Uh, mostly dari batch mana? Just nak dapat idea lah yang dah, tapi semua clinical years kan? Third year and fourth year. Alright. Fifth year baru habis exam right? 
Okay, uh, so Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, oh jap, sorry. Okay, mulai. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Tengku Nudahiyah binti Tengku Nikman. Uh, you can call me uh, Kak Dahiyah. Uh, so I'm from Rezis, just graduated about three, four months ago. And then, um, okay, so for today, uh, I would like to thank Max for inviting me to share a topic. I think very um, straightforward and interesting topics, uh, which is regarding a nephrotic syndrome. Now you, you all can see my slide, right? Okay, so this topic is a very uh, straightforward topic and uh, yet it's very important uh, as a clinical student because it being a bread and butter, especially in periodic posting. So for today, I would like to uh, narrow the discussion. Uh, I want to discuss nephrotic syndrome in pediatric posting. All right, so... Um, Sorry lah sebab slide ni buat main hentam je. Tak sangka apa. Jangan tanya lah kenapa gambar otak kat situ tapi cerita pasal renal kan. Okay so since it was a weekend booster so my mode of delivery today uh, more on I want to share how I want to study the nephrotic syndrome. So uh, macam more on booster lah. Uh, not really a formal lecture. So I will include some discussion at the end and I will share how actually we want to uh, structure our thinking when we want to revise this topic. Okay, so uh, kalau in along my presentation you have any question, you can just, um, uh, just uh, you can just interrupt and ask me uh, straightforward. Okay, so boleh continue, okay? So I might mix uh, English and Malay. Uh, so macam dah lama juga tak present kan after dah part bulan um, apa, graduate dah bersara. So uh, if anything terms yang you want me to explain more, just uh, ask me lah. Alright. Um, okay. So these are the gist of this topic. So in nephrotic syndrome, just like I said, right. and uh, usually the discussion uh, will go detail into the nephrotic itself. Uh, so that's why uh, I put there are some bit of a uh, role of theory uh, during our revision because usually um, lecturers, our lecturers, our doctor will ask uh, how the nephrotic syndrome occurs. So that uh, when the theory take part. So a bit of theory we have to know and the rest I think uh, just familiar with a clinical uh, scenario uh, about the diagnosis, the complication investigation management uh, and also some uh, emergency situation that we have to recognize and a bit of uh, discussion okay uh, next okay so um, as a clinical students um, we jangan pernah anggap teori tu dah ditinggalkan masa BMS lah uh, so which uh, in nephrotic syndrome uh, soalan uh, question about theory uh, memang quite frequent it boleh keluar in our PMP and also our clinical examination. Uh, so, and then um, how um, actually uh, we want to cater this part. Uh, actually, we have to revise and always uh, discuss and explain to our friends. So let's see what we have to know in a theory part. So actually, there are two main things that you have to cover, which is the first one is the clinical criteria to diagnose nephrotic syndrome and the second one is the pathogenesis okay so i will go one by one um, and uh, we will see uh, and uh, how actually uh, the nephrotic syndrome develop and by that we are easily um, can remember the clinical criteria of the nephrotic syndrome itself so let's see the first one Okay, uh, which is uh, the definition. So this one, I take it from PITS protocol. Okay, so nephrotic syndrome is defined as clinical syndrome of massive proteinuria. Okay, you might find difference. Kalau dalam Nelson, dia cakap glomerular disease. Tapi basically, dia nak arrange uh, sama je, which is uh, glomerular disease yang ada massive proteinuria. Ataupun uh, certain doktor guna perkataan nephrotic range proteinuria. 
So as it was a clinical syndrome, so means ada few clinical manifestation. So uh, just a very simple number, which is four clinical syndrome, uh, which is bila kita sebut nephrotic je, kita kena ingat empat benda ni. Okay, so the first one is edema. Second one, uh, hypoalbuminemia, proteinuria and hyperlipidemia. Okay, so basically yang ni, uh, based on four criteria ni, uh, we can uh, actually interpret, interpret this criteria. Uh, two out of them can be assessed through our clinical clucking, which is edema and also proteinuria. When the patient presented with edematous state, uh, macam uh, periabata edema, facial puffiness, ascites, ankle swelling. So, the clinical uh, sucking kita boleh dapat dah. This one criteria. Alright. And the second one is protein. Yeah? Usually, the complete is protein. Alright. So, uh, and uh, the next two ni, uh, basically based on the lab uh, finding. So, um, by hook or by crook, uh, yang ni figures, these figures is very important sebab they can ask in our PMP and also uh, in uh, discussion. So, uh, so OBA uh, and then um, figure ni tak ada lah banyak sangat. Uh, so, just saya kena ingat sikit lah. Okay, so edema tak ada any figures lah. So, for hypoalbuminemia, basically kita tahu albumin level in liver function test which is uh, the figure is less than 25 gram per liter or in certain lab, uh, they're going to gram over deciliter. So it can, it will be like this, less than 25 gram per deciliter, okay? Uh, and then for proteinuria, uh, there are two methods to quantify the protein, which is either by 24 hour uh, urine protein collection, or the second one is early morning urine protein creatinine index. Uh, or nama wanja dia usually we call as upchi. Okay, so for 24 hour urine, uh, usually I, uh, me myself, uh, usually I try to remember the easy way. So because of 24 hour, I just make yang one day punya collection. So 24 hour, so more than 1 mg over meter square per day. Okay, uh, but if uh, per hour, it takes as more than 40 milligram. Okay, oh sorry. Typo ni, one gram. Sekejap eh. Okay, one gram. Ha, nanti I betulkan lah. So for Uchi pula, uh, dia punya figure more than 200 milligram per pilimol. And the last one is hyperlipidemia. Okay, ni quite different kalau dalam page protocol, kalau take, uh, you all boleh sama-sama rujuk eh, uh, along my presentation ni. Uh, dia guna term hypercholesterolemia kan. Uh, basically dalam Nelson, uh, uh, I prefer to use the uh, term hyperlipidemia because it derange all the lipid profile, especially yang bad lipid such as LDL, VLDL, triglyceride and cholesterol, all will be high. However, for norm, uh, HDL, uh, usually it is low or normal HDL. So apa uh, benda yang kena uh, pick up dekat sini is uh, most question that lecturers suka tanya is what are the difference between nephrotic and also nephritic? Okay, so um, how I arrange this um, comparison, uh, I make it into um, the punya uh, category lah, make it into category. So for now, nephrotic and nephritic, basically it's four versus five. So for nephrotic, uh, for urine related, usually Nephrotic, they will be, uh, they will come with proteinuria. Make sure we complete as uh, proteinuria. And for nephritic, uh, usually it is, the patient uh, will present it as uh, hematuria or uh, they can um, complain that chocolate uh, colored urine. Uh, okay. So uh, this one, first one is regarding urine related. Okay. The second one, uh, the difference is more on systemic related, which in nephrotic, uh, the patient will have hyperlipidemia. Meanwhile, in nephrotic, uh, uh, the patient usually will suffer of hypertension. Okay, and then for the edema, usually in nephrotic, there will be a 
profound edema, um, patient will become very edematistic. Uh, macam kita tengok nephrotic punya patient tu memang kita akan cakap comel cabi. Uh, compared to nephrotic, the edema usually less profound. One uh, is regarding blood related. Uh, macam in nephrotic, there will be loss of protein. So there will be hypoalbuminemia. However, in nephritic, there will be impact in GFR. So less of uh, restriction of waste and cause uh, azotemia. Okay, and the last one. Only in nephritic, usually patient will present as oliguria. So this is an extra point for nephritic. However, uh, ada sedikit uh, kita panggil discrepancy macam in nephrotic ada certain patient yang boleh datang hypertension juga. So however macam benda tu uh, minority, okay. So this is the major differences yang kita boleh uh, apa ingat lah. Alright, so ni theory part one. Okay, okay tak setakat ni. Ada question tak? Cek eh, ada orang bagi kat chat ke? Sebab saya tak boleh nampak. Okay, then that's it. Alright. So kalau ada any question, just ask je lah. Nak, nak tanya kat chat room ke apa pun boleh. Okay, boleh continue okay? Okay. So uh, next uh, theory, uh, ni memang favourite question. In PMP, in discussion memang Dr. Saya suka sangat tanya, how uh, diaphoretic syndrome develop? So this is my advice to all the juniors lah. When you study pathogenesis kan, kan banyak source kan yang boleh cari. You find the most that, where, uh, the most uh, suitable. Uh, that suits your learning preference. Macam if you prefer the flow chart, uh, you find yang yang in terms of flow chart. Kalau suka tengok image, you so find an image that make you more uh, understand. Okay, so for me myself, I combine these two, the flow chart and also the image. So this one, um, basically, uh, I take it from our teaching uh, with Dr. Ismail and uh, this picture, I take it from Nelson. So uh, in uh, nephrotic syndrome, uh, basically, uh, doktor suka tanya, tapi macam tak perlu tahu in details pun, ada berapa teori. Ini ada, I mentioned semua ni. Okay, so basically ada dua uh, teori. Uh, eh. Okay, dia ada dua teori, underfill and overfill teori. So just tahu ada dua ni pun dah uh, cukup bersyukur lah. Uh, at least tahulah kan. So untuk pathogenesis ni, uh, in nephrotic, uh, basically uh, untuk underfill teori, dia basically kita start dengan what inside the renal. So yang ni saya bagi gambar our renal and this is our nephron system. So uh, what ha happened is uh, there is a podocyte effacement. So what is podocyte? Podocyte is a cell body that make up the filtration barrier. Filtration barrier ni ada dekat glomerulus. So from the vessels, uh, it will uh, filtrate to the glomerulus and the podocyte is the largest uh, filtration barrier in our glomerular filtration barrier. There are five members in this barrier, ada lima part guide uh, in this barrier. So podocyte ni yang paling largest and it will um, uh, give a main role lah in filtration. So what happens is there is the podocyte effacement. What does it mean by effacement is they become thinning. So Podocyte, uh, podocyte they have podium, kaki, yang banyak kaki ni. So there will be thinning. When there will be thinning, so there will be loss its integrity and loss effectivity to filtrate uh, the uh, waste of the, our blood. So uh, when the uh, podocyte become effaced, uh, the integrity loss, so it, it will alter the glomerular filtration barrier. Uh, so, macam mana they alter glomerular filtration barrier? First, it will increase the permeability. So, before this, it's very selective towards molecules. It only allows certain molecules to pass through the filtration. But once it becomes effaced, the dah thinning, so more molecules can pass through, even large molecules such as uh, protein, albumin. So, they all can pass through. So, that first thing happens. Okay? 
And the second one, there will be ionic changes. So, um, basement membrane. Okay, this one. Nampak tak? Uh, basement membrane. Okay, so uh, usually basement membrane in normal uh, physiology, our basement membrane is uh, negative charge. And albumin pun negative charge, okay? So, bila albumin uh, touch the uh, basement membrane, it will repel. However, in nephrotic syndrome, because of the podocyte effacement, they don't normally synthesize the basement membrane, so it become more positive. Oh, sorry. There. Alamak, I took you Okay, sekejap eh. Uh, sebab mouse ni nakal pula pagi ni. Dia main tekan je, okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sekarang keluar tak? Okay, keluar tak? Keluar lagi. Ada, ada. Okay dah. Uh, alah dah hilang dah semua tulisan tadi. Okay tak apalah. Okay. Sama tadi okay. Uh, so uh, ionic changes tadi kan. So bila uh, in nephrotic syndrome, it will change the GBM to become more positive. So albumin is negative charge. So it will attract more albumin towards the filtration barrier and more albumin can pass through. So that's why in the uh, nephrotic syndrome, there will be a proteinuria. So now we understand how the proteinuria occur. Okay, then due to loss of more solid goes to the uh, filtration uh, and then more albumin loss to the uh, kidney, to the renal system, there will be loss of albumin in the intravascular. So kat sini akan, akan low albumin. So that's why it cause hypoalbuminemia. So uh, next, after all the albumin, all the protein pass through the filtration, it will low in solute in the vessels. So it will reduce the oncotic pressure. Because of reduce in uh, oncotic pressure, so uh, surrounding cells will become more saturated, right? So there will be a fluid shift. Fluid shift from the intravascular to the extravascular space. This uh, is what we call as third space loss because of high hydrostatic pressure in the vessels. So next, because of that, it will cause edema. So now we have already three criteria we have covered in the pathogenesis. So when there are third space loss um, to this uh, upper interstitial uh, cell interstitium, so patient will be presented with edema. And the next one, um, other complication after the fluid shift is there will be a depletion depletion in the intravascular volume. So when, imagine that uh, in our vessels, loss of, uh, there will be loss of volume. So there will be loss of pressure. So that's why most um, the nephrotic uh, patient, we found there will be hypotension. And in serious case, there will become hypovolemia, which is a reduction of the blood. So when the reduction of blood flow reduce uh, to the uh, renal secretion, it will activate the rest system. Okay, so back to the basic lah, how actually the mechanism uh, of our body react when our blood pressure drops. Okay, so it will activate the rest system and the rest system uh, mainly to secrete more renin and to uh, 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 reduce, uh, to enhance the volume uh, production uh, in the in vessels. So it will retain sodium and water retention. So this sodium and water retention will uh, lead to edema itself. So nampak tak ada basically uh, banyak factors yang cause edema ni. So yang ni basically complete under field theory kita. So tadi I cakap there are two theories. So for the overfield theory, uh, dia uh, quite uh, straightforward tapi less 
uh, macam less practice lah sebab macam very uh, macam ada uh, argument lagi for overfit theory. So macam just saya nak senang nak ingat, ingat je overfit theory dia start kat sini. So basically dia akan start dengan primary rest activation and it leads to primary sodium and water retention and leads to edema. Uh, cuma contradictly overfit theory ni sebabkan dia start kat sini, usually patient akan ada high BP. Uh, so that's the difference lah, uh, sorry, high BP in uh, overfit theory. Okay, so this uh, ni yang I cakap ada five members of glomerular filtration barrier tadi. So podocyte ni yang main uh, role uh, playing in the nephrotic pathogenesis. Alright, so basically um, complete lah kita punya pathogenesis. Genesis of nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so far, ada questions ke? Sebab I tak nampak, so I just proceed. If any question, just ask, okay? So when we come to diagnosis, if you found a pediatric patient with edematous state, comel, chubby, so think first, uh, diagnosis yang kena keluar daripada mulut adalah idiopathic nephrotic syndrome unless proven otherwise. Okay, so this is the most common cause uh, of edema in pediatric uh, patient is, uh, which is from a renal causes. Okay, so for idiopathic nephrotic syndrome, um, it is a diagnosis, uh, a big diagnosis. So there are few uh, disease uh, under the umbrella of idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. So there are five. So you just have to know the numbers. There are five disease uh, under this uh, category, which is a minimal change nephrotic syndrome, messenger proliferation, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, membrane proliferative, glomerulonephritis, and membranous nephropathy. Okay, if you ask me, uh, do you have to know in details all the disease? The answer is no. Okay, but uh, there are two disease that maybe you want to read more uh, because certain doctors uh, left to us, which is what is the common uh, INS, uh, which is independent nephrotic syndrome, what is the common uh, subtype? It is minimal change nephrotic syndrome. And what is the most common type of steroid resistant of INS? It is focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So basically, these two ni yang macam penting sikit lah berbanding ada lima adik-beradik yang lain. Okay, so this is for diagnosis. So for differential, uh, okay, based on my experience, uh, basically uh, discussion about differentials is uh, uh, not so much uh, because uh, when you found a case of nephrotic syndrome, it's a straightforward case. And then usually more discussion regarding the management of the nephrotic syndrome itself. But we have to know the differential because we want to clock this patient and we want to at least rule out a bit of secondary cause. So in um, nephrotic syndrome, most common is primary cause, uh, which is yang idiopathic nephrotic syndrome, but there are also a secondary cause of nephrotic syndrome, okay, uh, such as uh, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis or immunological phenomenon such as in uh, SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, or also in malignancy such as Hodgkin lymphoma, anti-cell lymphoma also can cause a nephrotic syndrome. And other causes that you want to rule out such as cardiologic and also gastro the origin of edema. So, uh, kalau masa sempat, clucking, kita rule out sikit-sikit all this differential. Okay. Alright. So, we move on to the next one is complication. So, basically, there are a lot of complication in nephrotic syndrome. Uh, yang ni, uh, I share from Dr. Ismail. Uh, it might is very uh, easy to remember what are the complication. There are a lot. And uh, basically, uh, this is very important because you want to be a safe doctor. Okay. So, there are seven sequelae. So, with the number seven and circulate so as as right so this one uh, basically is a uh, presentation the patient can present with a complication so we have to rule out all this uh, seven throughout our clucking uh, to assess is there any risk of life-threatening conditions in our patient so the first one is hyperlipidemia so in hyperlipidemia, uh, uh, why, occur, uh, why does it occur in nephrotic syndrome? Because when there's loss of protein, uh, the liver will compensate uh, to synthesize more protein. So 
one of it can uh, produce lipoprotein. So because of the compensatory synthesis of lipoprotein, there will be increase of LDL, VLDL, and so on. Okay. And another reason, uh, another theory suggests that because of uh, lack of lipoprotein lipase, because the lipoprotein also can be lost uh, in the filtration. So because of that, um, the uh, enzyme, uh, like, uh, we have lack of enzyme to catabolize the lipid. Okay. And the next one is infection. So this is a very important complication that we have to rule out uh, in most of the patient uh, because it's a very life threatening condition. So remember there are three main infections that uh, usually can occur, which is SBP, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, cellulitis and pneumonia. So these three is, are very important. Uh, so why uh, the nephrotic syndrome itself exposed to the risk of infection because uh, they themselves is in immunosuppressive state because of loss of immunoglobulin uh, such as IgG, IgM or loss uh, uh, and then uh, also loss of complement factor to combat the infection. So these uh, two are the reason why the nephrotic syndrome is an immunocompromised uh, state. Uh, and also if they are on a steroid therapy, uh, they will be also in an immunocompromised uh, state patient. That's why they are uh, exposed to get infection. Okay. The third one is renal failure. So there are few reasons, a uh, few reasons why uh, the nephrotic syndrome can uh, progress to renal failure. So the first one because of hypovolemia. Hypovolemia itself reduce of uh, renal blood flow, so it can cause acute kidney injury. And uh, later, um, because of the state of nephrotic syndrome itself, is hypercoagulable state, so it can cause renal vein thrombosis. So after this, we will discuss about uh, the uh, thrombosis, um, apa, why, why they, they have risk of thrombosis. Okay, the third one, um, same, uh, because they are uh, exposed to infection, so they usually get urinary tract infection uh, and can cause scarring and also mm. cause uh, renal failure. And the fourth one, because of the therapy itself, uh, because of the steroid and also some uh, get uh, high hypertensive medication, so they can expose to um, renal injury. Okay, and the uh, next one, uh, urinary loss of binding protein. So there will be loss of TGB thyroglobulin uh, factor and also loss of calciferol binding group. So uh, later, because of this uh, two group uh, loss, uh, they can uh, have hypothyroid and also uh, hypocalcemia. Okay. The next one is hypovolemic collapse. So tadi kita dah belajar dah kan, in pathogenesis, there will be a depletion in the intravascular and cause hypovolemia. So in severe hypovolemia, so there will be loss, uh, less of uh, blood flow to the uh, our organ. So in um, nephrotic syndrome, if the patient presented with abdominal pain, we have, uh, we have to be really careful because they might have ischemic bowel due to the hypovolemia. And then um, remember, whenever you see a patient with protein syndrome, we have to assess the hemodynamic status. So this is the mnemonic to easily uh, remember the hemodynamic status. Okay, uh, nak tanya, siapa tahu what is CCTVR? Pernah dengar tak? Ada siapa-siapa uh, ni nak try? Oops, dua. Siapa pernah dengar pasal CCTVR? Ada orang tak? Tak pernah pula. Okay, uh, apa IV? Hello? Uh, tak, tak, tak pernah dengar. Oh, tak pernah dengar? <laughs> okay, ada sesiapa ni pernah uh, encounter ke this mnemonic? Uh, pernah, tak uh, dah ya. Ah, cuba siapa tak Aznira? Uh, yes. Cuba uh, share what is it? What is that? For the first C, uh, skin color and then second C, uh, capillary filling sign and then C, temperature and V, uh, pass volume and then uh, rate, uh, pass rate, uh, R to pass rate. 
Ah, okay. Thank you, Aznira. Okay. So that is a, a very a simple mnemonic. So macam bila doktor tanya how do you want to assess hemodynamic status, terus datang CCTVR. So benda ni sangat-sangat uh, common use lah macam in kalau uh, jumpa dengue patient ke kan. So we want hypervolemic patient. So kita uh, nak assess hemodynamic status, so CCTVR macam yang Aznira sebut tadi. So first is color. Uh, patient tu nampak pale ke, uh, apa, uh, warm ke, uh, sorry, pale ke, pink ke and then uh, the next thing C is CRT so kalau in hypervolume, it will be prolonged CRT and uh, third one is temperature so uh, rasa lah cold ke, warm ke and for V and R, it basically regarding the pulse so pulse volume and pulse rate so remember lah, bila jumpa nephrotic syndrome, we want to assess the CCTVR, okay So the next one is thromboembolism. So uh, basically, uh, nephrotic uh, uh, patient, uh, it is a hypercoagulable state. So why does it happen? Uh, there are a few reasons. Okay, the first reason is because uh, loss of anti-thrombotic factors. So anti-thrombotic factors such as anti-thrombin 3, protein C, protein S. And also there is increased production of fibrinogen. So these two make it more um, uh, hypercoagulability in the vessel. So there are risks to get thrombosis. And the next reason because uh, the hypovolemia itself, so there will be a blood stasis, blood stasis to it disrupt the blood flow. So based on the virtual triad, um, uh, it can risk of thrombosis uh, when there is a blood stasis, okay? And the last one is complication of therapy. So complication of therapy ni, uh, there are few complications. But I want to highlight these two, okay? So we know that uh, the main management of um, nephrotic syndrome is steroid. So you have to recognize the condition of steroid toxicity in an acute or chronic setting, okay? So they will become in acute condition, maybe there will be a GI discomfort, infection, delayed wound healing, okay? In the chronic, uh, in the chronic patient who have uh, steroid, uh, there will be a growth disturbance, so we have to look at the growth parameters, uh, such as short stature and other complications such as cataract, glaucoma, cushion of feature. So cushion of feature ni, a list of cushion of feature lah kan? Macam pernah dengar kan, buffalo harm, ada purple stray uh, and then uh, last one is uh, peptic ulcer disease. So we have to recognize these two condition. Okay, this is the complication of therapy and for the treatment, uh, basically based on the patient itself, uh, either we want to taper the dose or we want to change the steroid to other agents, steroid sparing. Um, and we have to refer to respective specialty. Contohnya kalau macam peptic ulcer disease, we want to refer to the surgeon team, okay? Uh, so the next one is complication of therapy ni, acute adrenal crisis. So uh, what happens is uh, after they being on long term of uh, corticosteroid, uh, after the cessation uh, of the corticosteroid therapy, Uh, and they get stress, macam infection ke, so there will be acute adrenal crisis. So apa yang berlaku dalam acute adrenal crisis ni, be before this they get exogenous steroid, kan? We give them exogenous steroid by medication. So dia dah lama dah tak produce dia punya endogenous steroid, dia dah suppress. So when dia dah off dia punya steroid and then ada infection, so it takes some time to produce dia self punya cortisol. Uh, so that's we call as acute adrenal crisis. So how to re uh, recognize the condition? Uh, the patient usually presented with vomiting, abdominal pain and refractory hypovolemic shock. Refractory hypovolemic shock ni maksudnya when we give fluid therapy or we give the pressure therapy, they will not respond, okay? So we might think there will be a acute adrenal crisis. So treatment dia kita kena bagilah balik exogenous steroid to either hydrocortisone ataupun prednisolone. Okay, just tahu basically the idea of that. Okay, uh, so that's for complication. Okay, so next we move on to investigation. So now we have recognized the condition, we already know the pathogenesis, we know the clinical criteria and the complications. So it's easy to structure our thinking how we want to investigate this patient. Okay. So uh, ni I share macam mana Dr. Mossad, uh, Dr. Prof. Mossad. Prof. Mossad uh, taught us how we want to structure our answer. So they, uh, 
uh, we can divide it into four main categories site, laboratory, radiological, and special investigation. Okay, so ni uh, just nak ajar lah macam mana cara macam kita nak structure kita punya investigation kan. So for the back side, in nephrotic lah, uh, uh, kalau jenis lain boleh buat uh, other version lah. So in nephrotic, uh, usually for the back side, we can do the urine district, the most simple and practical way to quantify the protein. So tengoklah sama ada how many plus, one plus, two plus or two plus, okay. And the next one is laboratory investigation. So uh, yang ni basically initial investigation when we encounter uh, first presentation of nephrotic syndrome. So masa tu uh, doktor akan tanya what we want to do, how do you want to investigate? So kita list kan semua and uh, investigation ni, confirm the list, okay? So uh, start with uh, basic uh, investigation such as full blood count. So full blood count ni kita nak tengok sebab tadi kita kata dia, uh, dia dah lose uh, more uh, apa protein semua tu so the, the blood will become concentrated. So basically kita nak tengok hematocrit level and also the platelet level lah uh, in the full blood count. Okay, for the renal profile, sama juga, we want to uh, see there is a, a, a evidence of renal injury uh, but usually it is a progressive, um, uh, it takes a long course. Uh, usually in first presentation, the renal profile is usually normal. Okay, the third one is lipid profile. So we know why you want to add the lipid profile because it's one of the criteria uh, which is hyperlipidemia. So uh, kita uh, nak tengok all the uh, uh, LDL, the triglyceride, cholesterol. Okay, and the fourth one is liver function test. So um, basically kita tahu dah kenapa kan nak hantar liver function test tadi nak tengok albumin. Okay, and the fifth one quantitative urinary protein excretion. So this one is either two methods. Uh, just like uh, I said before, either we want to do OPTI, uh, urine protein creatinine index, or 24 hour urine protein. So either two methods uh, can uh, do the diagnosis, okay. And the sixth one is urine analysis or urine culture. So jadi kita want to uh, want to send because we want to see and to rule out other uh, possible diagnosis juga. We want to see the RBC cast, the cellular cast and also sign of uh, infection, okay. So this is the initial investigation. So for radiological uh, for nephrotic syndrome uh, per se, basically uh, tak ada investigation untuk uh, radiological yang penting but if you suspect patient tu sampai develop pulmonary edema ke, you may want to order but for now uh, tak ada lagi untuk initial investigation okay and then the next one is special investigation. So special investigation ni uh, basically kita hantar when needed, when necessary. Uh, so sebab tu kena tengok patient basis lah. Uh, kalau you think that you have to send now, you uh, order straight away. As long as you know why you send for the investigation. Okay. So when we are suspicious of secondary cause of the nephrotic syndrome and also when we suspect there might be other diagnosis. Okay. So um, Renal biopsy is one of the special investigation. Not all the patients straight away in the first presentation, kita nak buat renal biopsy. Okay, so there are indications. Later we will discuss about the indication of renal biopsy. And the second one, we want to exclude uh, other diagnosis macam SLE. So, sorry, SLE. So kita nak hantar anti-nuclear factor, anti-double cell DNA. Uh, and then we would like to send serum complement level to exclude also inflammation disease and also post-infectious glomerulonephritis and other tests as indicated. For example, maybe you want to send for SOT if you suspect uh, it is due to glomerulonephritis, okay? So these are the, the way you want to classify and structure your answer for investigation. Okay, so next, last one this management. Okay, so management ni uh, memang kena pay attention sikit. Uh, siapa nak minum air boleh minum air dulu. Sebab this one yang memang very, uh, memang uh, favorite lah, favorite discussion in discussion of nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so basically uh, macam I personally, kita boleh tengok dalam pitch protocol memang dia dah bagi full, cantik lah um, flow of management of uh, nephrotic syndrome, right? Uh, tapi um, Macam I cakap, you have to be creative in your revision. Uh, find the best way for you to remember. Maksudnya bila cakap je management of uh, nephrotic syndrome, kita akan kabut, tak gelabah. So macam mana kita nak structure kita punya answer tu. So ni uh, I share uh, macam mana 
cara yang uh, I suka based on Dr. Ismail punya flow. Okay. So this one, uh, nampak tak ada Coca-Cola kat sini. So there are mnemonics uh, because I'm a Malay patient. Okay, I'm a Malay girl. Uh, so which is uh, other Coca. So we go one by one lah. Okay, so basically there are six uh, main management for nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so the first one is A. Okay, so A is for admission. So when um, uh, we see the patient, we have to think and we have to figure out does the patient need or not admission. So how we want to know? So first, uh, is it the first presentation? So usually, uh, okay, usually uh, first presentation uh, in our practice we will uh, admit patient to confirm the diagnosis. So how do you want to confirm the diagnosis? Back to the we want to do the initial investigation. So tadi ada berapa tadi? Ada enam kan investigation tadi. So we want to do all the investigation to confirm it is a nephrotic syndrome. Okay. And the second one when a patient presented with acute event. So we want to be a safe doctor. So we, a patient datang dengan uh, breathlessness, uh, hypovolemic collapse, semua tu kita nak admit patient infection uh, because there is a risk of complication. So acute event, admit patient. Okay. And the third one, uh, we want to educate the parents. So basically, uh, ni to first presentation lah. So usually kita nak, walaupun maybe tak terlalu teruk at first presentation, tapi kita nak admit because we want to educate the parents because there are a uh, few uh, advice that we have to give to the parents macam regarding the relapse, disease risk and immunization. Okay, so benda ni, uh, trigger ni je yang macam paling penting. Kenapa kita nak admit patient? Okay, so the second one, so kita dah settle A tadi. So D. So D is for dietary. So remember in pediatrics uh, is uh, very important to uh, apa? Untuk kita preserve the well-being of the patient kan. So patient still young, they want to grow. So for dietary, in nephrosyndrome, syndrome, there will be no any protein restriction. So remember that, okay. So for dietary, we have to advise uh, them to have a adequate calories and can have a normal protein diet. Okay, so itu yang paling recommended. Okay, sebab so, uh, patient kalau macam even on steroid pun, orang akan kacau the growth kan. So kita nak dietary memang uh, very important lah to put uh, in our management. Okay, and the third one is E. Okay, so ada coca E. So E for edema. So how we want to treat edema? So the uh, in nephrotic uh, syndrome in pediatric is not same as uh, in adults. Uh, or added causes of edema. So salt and fluid uh, restriction is not indicated. Okay, but if you read in the PITS protocol, it said that uh, the fluid restriction unless patient very gross, grossly edematous. Tapi to be safe uh, as a medical student, uh, Dr. Pudas uh, memang sangat-sangat uh, uh, tekankan lah uh, jawab there will be no indication of salt and fluid restriction. Uh, that will be the safe answer. Okay. Uh, uh, and then the second one, if uh, the role of IV human albumin. So this one only can be allowed uh, after uh, being supervised by nephrologist. So uh, when it is indicated to give human albumin, basically we give human albumin to induce the diuresis. So IV human albumin, when the patient are presented with symptomatic hypovolemia and symptomatic gross edema. So only these two conditions, we can consider to give IV human albumin, okay? And uh, the next one is diuretics. So is there any role of diuretics in nephrotic syndrome in pediatrics? So basically it is not indicated uh, to give diuretics unless patient to betul-betul symptomatic uh, edema ataupun after uh, we give IV human albumin, they develop hypervolemia. So we can give diuretics, okay? So that's only the indication to give diuretics. It's not a uh, compulsory to give a diuretics at first. Uh, another complication, oh, lupa nak cakap, uh, when we give uh, IV human albumin, uh, we have to uh, beware of, sorry, uh, anaphylactic, anaphylactic shock because they can develop uh, allergics uh, to the human albumin. So that's why uh, we have to be careful lah. Okay, so ada uh, settle 
So next we go for CO. So CO stands for corticosteroid. Okay, so for corticosteroid therapy, uh, it is very effective in uh, idiopathic nephritis syndrome. Um, and it's the main management uh, that we give to our patient. So how we want to give the corticosteroid therapy, we follow the algorithm in the pediatric protocol. So later we will go uh, together how you want to understand the algorithm. So this is the dose. Uh, tak apa. Uh, uh, kita tinggal dulu kat sini. Next kita akan bincang lebih lagi pasal corticosteroid therapy ni. And the fifth one which is C to read reduce risk of complications. So uh, remember to be safe doctor, uh, we want to avoid any life threatening conditions. So how to avoid uh, uh, risk of complications such as infection. So we will recommend it to give a uh, pneumococcal vaccine and also antibiotic. Antibiotic is especially patients come with very big ascites. Uh, so we want to avoid peritonitis, so we give a penicillin V. Basically, you don't have to remember the dose. Dalam bilik suatu kan, ada banyak dose kan? So, uh, yang ni tak perlu. Just remember, okay, there is a rule of antibiotics to risk of infection. And the uh, last one, kita nak tengok, watch out for hemodynamic status. So, yang ni macam tadi saya cakap, CC, TBR. So, they can have hypovolemia or hypovolemia. And the last one is A. So COCA. So last is advice. So yang ni uh, is a very special if you can uh, throw out during the discussion. Uh, but uh, doctor akan sangat-sangat suka bila kita include advice ni in our uh, step of management. So uh, this is very important sebab mostly nephritis syndrome ni memang orang ada uh, the long uh, course and macam kita jumpa nephritis syndrome sampai dah besar pun still ada nephritis syndrome right so this basically we want to educate the parents uh, about the disease risk and relapse but mostly 85% akan ada relapse uh, in nephritis syndrome okay and next uh, we have to advise about how to do home urine albumin monitoring so uh, ask the patient uh, uh, as the sorry as the parents to uh, quantify the albumin monitoring in a book, do once daily in morning of the first urine sample. And then how, uh, when they have to come to see our attention. So this is a warning condition that we have to advise to the parents. When the urine did stick is more than two plus for three consecutive days or three out of seven. Maksudnya three out of seven ni tak semestinya consecutively. So in one week too, if three out of seven already have more than two, it is uh, compulsory to ask for doctor advice, okay? Uh, and another condition, if the child is become very edematous, regardless of the urine district, they have to come to see the doctor. And the last one about immunization. So for nephritic syndrome, um, immunization, um, in, uh, if uh, they want to get kill vaccine, it's not a problem. So kill vaccine is always permissible. Uh, however, for the live vaccine, only can be given after six weeks of cessation of corticosteroid therapy. Okay, so these are the six uh, management of cortico, uh, sorry uh, of nephritis syndrome. So okay, tak sakit ni. Boleh follow tak? Ada lagi ke orang kat sana? Okay, okay. Alright. So, uh, okay. so yang ni yang kita akan bincang detail sikit pasal corticosteroid therapy. So, uh, first macam uh, when I uh, student dulu pun memang rasa macam uh, susahnya nak follow algorithm ni sebab uh, personally macam tak nampak sangat inhibition ni kan. So, yang ni yang dalam PITS protocol. So basically kita boleh simplify lagi ataupun kita boleh uh, make it uh, most uh, understandable based on our uh, apa preference lah. So yang ni uh, dalam PITS protocol, so I just nak share macam mana cara me and my study group uh, ingat lah untuk management of particular structure therapy ni. So first of all, kita kena tahu the terms. Okay. So yang ni yang uh, paling penting untuk corticosteroid regime ni, kita kena recognize our patient ni dekat which state. Uh, so these are the terms yang memang ada uh, definition dia by each and memang certain doctors uh, they love to ask uh, what, do you, what did you mean by steroid resistant? How do you recognize a remission period? So there are five 
terms that you have to remember. Uh, Personally, ni I tak ada cara nak ingat <laughs> untuk yang ni. Uh, so nanti bolehlah uh, bincang dengan study group masing-masing how to remember kan. So yang ni I susun based on um, the punya consequence lah. So first is steroid resistant. So steroid resistant ni condition yang kita akan tahu at the first initial four weeks kita bagi treatment. So that's why I put it at first. Uh, because we, when we have the patient of nephrotic syndrome, we will start the corticosteroid therapy and then within the four weeks, kita dah tahu dah sama ada they need steroid resistant or not. Okay, so steroid resistant when they fail to achieve response for the initial four weeks treatment with the uh, pregnancy of corticosteroid. So this one, initial four weeks tu, kita dah boleh diagnose patient tu steroid resistant or not. Okay, clear eh? Untuk yang first tu. So yang second one is uh, ni yang bila dah response tu maksudnya bila dah boleh achieve uh, remission. So what does it mean by remission ni? Basically uh, based based on the urine lipstick. Uh, sama ada it is the result is trace or nil. Trace ni uh, macam one plus ataupun zero lah for the three consecutive days. So we say that the patient has achieved remission. Alright. Uh, the next term is relapse. So relapse is condition when the urine district become two plus for three consecutive days. Okay, so uh, terbalik je lah. Tadi trace only, then ni two plus lah. Okay, for the frequent relapse, so there are two ways we can say the patient is frequent relapse. So the first one, bila develop two relapse, oh sorry. Bila they develop two relapse, within six months of initial diagnosis. So yang ni when the uh, basically uh, start kita diagnose nephrotic syndrome, kita tengok six months tu, if more than two relapse, uh, can consider the patient uh, have a frequent relapse, okay? Uh, for the next uh, way, uh, when the patient have four, so two in six, four in twelve. Okay, so for in trial ni any 12 months period. So macam kita akan jumpa patient yang fertility syndrome yang dah berumur 10 tahun, 10 tahun yang dah lama. So within any one year, where they have more than four relapse, we can say the patient have a frequent relapse, okay. So the last one is steroid dependent patient. So what does it mean by steroid dependent patient ni? Bila more than two consecutive relapse. So yang ni dia punya keyword dia. Beza dengan frequent relapse tadi. So the other consecutive relapse, muscle steroid tapering, okay. Muscle, uh, we reduce the dose, they develop relapse two times, okay. So, yang tu kita panggil steroid dependent or within two weeks after kita stop the steroid, after the cessation of the steroid. So, this is uh, the patient we call as steroid dependent. So, yang ni uh, nak tak nak memang kena ingat lah uh, terms untuk uh, dalam nephrotic syndrome ni. So macam mana next untuk kita manage? Okay. So sebenarnya bila once kita dah tahu uh, uh, the condition of our patient, so it's easy to remember the algorithm. Okay. So kita go one by one. So just take it uh, like this je. So benda ni sama as basically uh, nampak idea tu you can uh, you guys dah boleh faham dah macam mana. Okay. So steroid response ni maksudnya macam normal patient yang okay yang memang uh, tak ada relapse so they very responsive to steroid. So apa yang berlaku first four week once kita diagnose kita start terus steroid. The dose 60 mg per meter square per day. Okay so yang ni meter square ni jangan takut dengan punya, uh, unit ni meter square ni basically kita ada cara kiraan dia which is body surface area. Uh, uh, basically macam uh, Nak, dia sunat je lah, nak tahu boleh tak tahu tak apa. Kalau tahu lagi bagus lah. Ha. Tapi yang wajib tahu adalah STMG ni. Ha. So kita kata tahu this is a uh, induction dose. Okay. Okay. Yang uh, macam mana cara nak kira meter squat tu so nak muakat je lah. Okay. So for STMG uh, for four weeks ni uh, basically uh, kita panggil dia as, uh, as an induction dose. So maximum is at milligram. Okay. So this one is a consensus uh, in the management of uh, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, kalau tengok dalam page protocol dia lain sikit kan. Uh, uh, tapi ni memang after discuss dengan doktor, doktor still ambil uh, maximum 80 mg lah. Okay. So uh, after that four weeks the response well so kita akan paper down to 40 mg. So this is a paper dose 40 mg. 
So 40 mg per EOD uh, every other day. So every other day ni maksudnya kita akan bagi selang sehari, alternating day. So the maximum uh, dose is 60 mg. Okay, and then if the response tak ada relapse, so next four weeks kita taper lagi for 30 mg. So based on the consensus, usually they take as uh, taper 25%. So 35% daripada 40, 30. So 60, 40, 30. Okay, ni yang patient yang normal, yang okay, uh, tak ada relapse. So that's kita stop je. Okay, so bila dia relapse, so ingat relapse ni active 5% of patient, active 5% patient maka dapat relapse. So usually uh, memang uh, kita uh, akan treat macam ni lah kalau tengok kat hospital pun kebanyakannya memang ada relapse lah. Okay, so apa yang berlaku when they relapse, so we give back reinduced dose. Okay, so kita start balik induction dose. So yang ni bukan four weeks dah, kita bagi until remission. Okay, so tadi kita dah tengok balik apa criteria remission kan. So ni criteria remission, so kita bagi je 60 mg per day until they remit. After they remission, then baru kita follow yang four weeks of 40 mg EOD. After that, kita stop. Okay, that's for relax. Okay, so boleh follow yang ni dia tak ada masa for weeks so dia terus je sampai dia remission. Okay, so if frequent relapse, okay maksudnya bila frequent relapse tadi tu yang within 6 month 2 kali, within 12 month 4 kali. So after, uh, kalau dia patient tu adalah frequent relapse, so basically yang first tu ni sama macam relapse, kita bagi balik anti remission and then lepas dah remit kita bagi 4 weeks 40 mg. Okay, so tambahan sikit sebab difficult relapse, kita ada 6 month period ni. Okay, so 6 month period ni untuk kita bagi dose tu as low as possible. Yang takkan bagi dorang relapse. Uh, so kita akan bagi uh, taper every two weeks and kita bagi dose yang paling sweet uh, untuk uh, apa supaya dorang tak ada relapse. So yang ni pun kita bagi EOD for 6 month. Okay, kalau lah so masa kita tengah taper ni pun jadi tiba ada relapse balik so kita bagi patah balik, patah balik ke induction balik, ha, macam tu lah. So kalau tak berjaya, kita nak start balik dari rumah, bagi balik induction. Okay so that is for frequent relapse. Okay uh, the next one is steroid dependent. Okay steroid dependent tadi macam uh, bila ada dua kali betul turut relapse tu. Okay so apa yang berlaku masa patient ni ada dua kali betul turut relapse, uh, kita kena tengok patient tu sama ada the non steroid toxic or is it steroid toxic patient. So how to recognize steroid toxic tu macam tadi kita dah go through apa maksud steroid toxicity kan. So contohnya kalau patient tu short statured, ada kunshinoid features, so it is a steroid toxic patient. Tapi kalau okay je, uh, ada one patient tu well, so it is a non steroid toxic patient. Okay. So kalau the non steroid toxic, kita treat macam uh, relapse je which is kita akan reinduce balik and kita bagi low dose possible. Okay tapi kalau dah develop steroid toxic, so kita kena be, be lagi more careful. So kita might want to consider to change to cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide ni adalah one type of steroid sparing agent lah. So uh, uh, usually uh, tak perlu tahu pun dia punya dose. Uh, uh, doktor tak pernah tanya lah. Uh, tapi doktor suka tanya yang ni, yang merah ni. Uh, so that's why I put here. So what are the side effect of cyclophosphamide? Uh, so this why we have to be careful. So they will become leukopenia, alopecia, hemorrhagic cystitis, gonorrhea toxicity and future malignancy. So this are the side effect. Uh, ni ni memang kat mana-mana soalan pun masuk suka tanya pasal cyclophosphamide punya uh, side effect ni. Okay, and then uh, bila bagi cyclophosphamide tu, they still relapse. So masa dia relapse lagi, uh, masa on cyclophosphamide, kita back towards our judgement tadi. Dia non-steroid toxic ataupun steroid toxic. So kalau dia non-steroid toxic, uh, kita akan treat as relapse. Oh. oh sorry, okay. Kita akan treat as relapse. Tapi kalau dia steroid toxic, masa ni kita nak refer to pitch nephrologies. Maybe we want to change other steroids sparing agent macam cyclosporine. So cyclosporine pun tak perlu tahu dos uh, tapi yang favorite question is this, the side effect of cyclosporine. Okay, so this one for steroid dependent. Okay, so the last one, okay dah, dah nak habis ni. For steroid resistant. So for steroid resistant, um, basically kita tahu tadi masa four weeks of initial uh, corticosteroid therapy kita dah tahu dah patient ni steroid resistant ke tak. 
So when dia tak ada response, uh, tak ada change semua Radiolistik really dia still high, so kita hantar for renal biopsy So yang ni first management yang kita kena buat, okay And the next one, um, yang ni adalah management untuk serial resistant while we uh, waiting lah for the result and uh, we want to uh, help the patient to uh, because they have uh, the proteinuria itself semua tu so kita reduce kat edema dia so untuk serial resistant they said that they have a role to restrict the dietary sodium and also give diuretics Uh, so uh, itu je exception dalam serial resistant ni Macam tadi tak payah kan nak bagi uh, So yang ni kita ada rule untuk restrict sodium And the third one to reduce the proteinuria We give acid inhibitor and juga uh, ARB So acid inhibitor dan ARB ni be careful Because they actually can also derange the renal profile So once we give the acid inhibitor Kena ambil uh, regularly um, renal profile Uh, because they can cause renal uh, injury juga, okay. So next one, control hypertension. Uh, untuk control hypertension ni, kita bagi badi, uh, sama je ubat dia, is inhibitor ataupun ARB. And then um, next, bagi penicillin prophylaxis. if the patient, uh, we suspect they might have risk of infection. And this is one sama je, nutrition for diet. And the last one, kita kena evaluate the calcium and phosphorus metabolism. Really basically, uh, because a lot of, uh, apa, the kidney function, Cik Isaf dah uh, di impact, so kita uh, always look for the, uh, the the serum calcium and serum phosphate. Okay, so I think that's all for the management of corticosteroid. Okay, uh, next. Okay, so next is indication for renal biopsy. So basically, um, uh, this is one of favorite uh, uh, question juga uh, because um, when we have to Uh, order for renal biopsy. Okay, so basically untuk nephrotic syndrome, macam tadi it's not necessary to do renal biopsy at first encounter. Uh, but when uh, it was indicated, when the patient is steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. So after four weeks tak ada respon, kita send for renal biopsy. And other uh, indication basically when we suspicious there might be other problems of uh, uh, nephrotic. Uh, such as macam secondary cause ke apa so bila patient datang dengan persistent hypertension ataupun uh, when there is a renal impairment and abnormal kidney function uh, usually it's a uh, not uh, apa it's a progressive uh, renal impairment tapi patient tu datang memang dah teruk renal impairment semua tu so maybe kita nak buat renal biopsy and then bila ada grossly hematuria which is uh, not a usual presentation in nephrotic syndrome and also when there is a persistent abnormal serum complement. So we want to see if there is other causes uh, that cause the nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so that is uh, the, these are the indications for renal biopsy. Okay, so uh, this one, uh, just a table I take from Nelson, just want to show you um, the five, uh, five types right of the uh, idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. So basically, as you can see, this is the most common one, kan? minimal change of the syndrome. So usually 90% will remit after 8 weeks of oral corticosteroid. Maksudnya kalau dia MNCS ni memang dia sangat uh, responsive to steroid. But if patient to resistant, it might be other type of uh, idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. Macam FSGS, uh, only 20% je respond. So other 80% tu resisting. Uh, and then the rest macam sama juga lah, resistant juga. So that's why I just want to show you ada possibility patient tu memang resistant to steroid. So we have to know lah patient tu steroid responsive ataupun steroid resistant patient. Okay, then um, okay. So this is my last slide I think. Uh, for emergency situation. So basically uh, this one um, we have to Uh, be careful and be aggressive when we see the patient. If the patient came with free overload, uh, acute adrenal crisis, hypervolumic collapse and infection. So basically this one we have already discussed before. So just want to highlight more uh, in what situation the fertility syndrome can be life threatening conditions. Okay. Okay, these are my references. So, so far, is there any question uh, before I proceed to a bit of uh, exercise? Ada soalan tak setakat ni? Kenapa dia keluar? Elok, eh, okey. Ada soalan? 
Thank you, Ataya, uh, for a very informative uh, sharing. Um, for the participant, you can open your mic uh, or write in the chat box to ask the question. If there is no question, uh, I think Dr. Uh, Nadira. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, macam within four weeks yang kita bagi steroid, lepas tu kita tunggu like uh, nak tunggu respon, nak tengok respon tu. What mm -hmm. are the parameters that we are looking at to say that this patient is respond to it, is responsive towards the uh, steroid? Okay, thank you for your question. So basically within that four weeks, uh, there are the dua, uh, sorry. Okay, there are dua cara for two methods to see the responsive to treatment, uh, which is the first one uh, clinically. So clinically, we want to see is the uh, nephrotic range proteinuria itself is resolved. Maksudnya, dia dah less edema and also it, uh, the tak develop any complications. So we said that response. Okay, so uh, the next one is the urine dead state. So that's why we have to really advise the parents to quantify the urine albumin uh, monitoring tu every day. So we want to see the progression. But sometimes, uh, macam tadi kan, when we want to see the patient, uh, doctor kan, patient become very edematous, tapi urine dextrate dia maybe okay. Uh, tapi patient dah develop complications more. So, uh, basically, maksudnya patient tu not respond well. Okay. But another condition pula, uh, dia punya urine dextrate tu very poor. Tapi patient tak develop lagi, maybe tak manifest lagi. Uh, so in both condition we are worried. So these two parameters we see lah clinically and also the uh, parameters of urine state untuk tengok the remission. Uh, sorry, untuk dia tengok the response, okay? Uh, okay, doctor, thank you. Uh, doctor, uh, nak tanya, ada pernah dengar tak yang macam negative or positive weight balance tu? Is it important for us to know in nephrotic syndrome? Uh, tak perlu. <laughs> uh, yang tu uh, uh, tak payah tahu. Even yang tu pun um, dia tak semestinya dalam nephrotic je. In cardiology case pun ada juga positive and negative balance semua tu. So basically uh, it's not necessary lah. Maybe dia punya hukum tu harus juga. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Yang penting tahu patient tu uh, steroid response ataupun steroid resistant. Uh, and then how they manage lah. Okay, ada ada uh, another question? Uh, yes, at the chat box, uh, Sister Amani, uh, no Amani Pahana asked, is there any cut off point of uh, obvious edema for indication of the DOT? Okay, so basically uh, this is a clinical judgment lah. Maksudnya kita pun uh, macam edema itself is a clinical manifestation. Kita tak ada certain macam uh, berapa persen edema macam kalau periobital edema je 30 persen tak ada. Okay so basically uh, what they say is uh, symptomatic edema. So symptomatic gross edema ni maksudnya patient become breathlessness, uh, macam a very big gross ascites uh, and then uh, macam anasalka atau tak anasalka very full body swelling uh, sampai sacral swelling, genital swelling. So this is what we call as symptomatic uh, gross edema which might need uh, diuretics. Uh, so that's, um, I think that's my answer for that question. So there is no, uh, there's no specific figures, but we have to be a uh, uh, clinical judgment of uh, the patient's conditions. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, kalau dah tak ada soalan, uh, sebenarnya I try to end at 11. So, you guys nak rehat ke nak buat macam exercise terus? I think we can post it. Uh, okay. Okay, kalau tak apa ke um, organizer kita habis awal, kita kena 2 jam juga. Okay je, okay. Okay je kan, hari minggu kan, korang nak relax-relax. Okay, so kita buat sikit selesai. Uh, basically, um, uh, I want to ask lah, uh, sekarang ni still sama kan format untuk uh, clinical exam? So dia still buat uh, modified long case kan? 
Betul ke? Uh, what I mean by modified tu maksudnya yang just you have uh, about 20 minutes preparation and then 20 minutes discussion. Macam tu ke still sama ke format tu? Ke korang tak exam lagi? Time year 3 modified. Time year 3 uh, sekarang? Sekarang uh, saya year 4 so tak tahu year 5 macam mana. Ah okay okay. Okay uh, year 4 tak modified eh? Uh, untuk orto modify ni mungkin sekejap. Oh sama juga lah. Okay. Ha. So just uh, basically ni just open discussion je. Macam throw out je what is your uh, opinion. Okay. So uh, this is a case when patient came to you with generalized edema. So what would be the diagnosis? Can anyone give uh, some points? Just apa yang terlintas je. And ataupun just any comments regarding this statement. If you want to ask for, uh, for the, okay, anyone to try? Ada, ada yang nak try tak? Ada yang nak uh, bercakap sikit pagi, pagi ni? Siapa eh? Uh, nak saya panggil nama ke? <laughs> Atas suka nak panggil nama saya. Just try je. Siapa? Nadira ke tadi? Uh, I think uh, for this patient, uh, we, uh, maybe I want to know more about the age of the patient because I would like to suggest uh, if patient has generalized edema, maybe we, uh, we want to think of heart problem, renal problem or liver problem. Okay. Um, but uh, yes, uh, we need to know about the age of the patient. For example, like heart problem, uh -huh. maybe patient has heart failure. Mm, okay. Renal problem, maybe renal failure or like nephrotic syndrome itself mm. or maybe mm -hmm. patient has um, post-structural glomerular nephritis and liver failure, chronic uh, liver disease for example. Alright, um, good. We want to think of anaphylactic shock of the patient. Alright, good. Okay, any other uh, information that you want to extract more? Um, there is also a comment uh, mentioned that about family history of renal disease. Okay, good. And then uh, the other associated symptom uh, with the generalized edema. Alright, so very good. Okay, so uh, so basically that's, uh, that's the answer that I want to hear. So basically when um, I nak cakap when we, we become a doctor, you have to look the patient, okay? So bila saya dapat call ke patient datang jenis edema, Jangan terlalu diagnosis but look at your patient. So uh, just a simple recap um, in the clinical tracking. So basically want, first you want to know the age lah of the patient kan macam yang Anadira cakap tadi tu. Uh, because uh, in pediatric case, adult case, uh, it might be different in the priority of the diagnosis. Okay, so in the pediatrics, if the patient came with generalized edema, um, and uh, kita tengok patient still young, okay. So we might think the renal cause as the most top diagnosis compared to other diagnosis. So uh, macam um, contohnya pediatrics usually most common so that's actually uh, bila datang dengan generalized edema, the diagnosis, uh, the pediatric natural disease alis problem otherwise kan. Tapi we have to exclude also other diagnosis. So age is a very important um, figures that we have to know. And the second one, we want to elaborate more about this since the symptom. So regarding the duration, so we want to know how long uh, the edema have been occurred. Is it uh, chronic edema or just acute edema? Uh, so that might be a, a different inputs, okay? And then any associated symptoms. So we know that uh, for nephrotic syndrome, the quite clinical criteria like that you know, and also the complications. So maybe we want to know patient, this is the um, uh, simple case or complicated case. Uh, okay, so masa complicated ni maksudnya ada complication apa semua and also we want to rule out other causes macam Nadia cakap tadi possible ada cardiac causes okay macam heart failure uh, ataupun uh, kita nak tengok other secondary causes uh, macam maybe patient ni ada develop 
uh, uh, fatis, uh, macam dari hematuria ke. So, it might give a different um, priority in our diagnosis, okay? And also, we want to uh, elaborate more because we want to exclude other differentials. Uh, so, when you see the patient, always think it structurally how we want to actually reach towards uh, the answer. And the last one is past history. So, macam tadi ada family history and basically, uh, macam need tips lah untuk uh, apa, modified. Uh, sekarang kan modified punya exam kan. So, memang first of all, you can ask macam this is a new case ataupun follow up case ke ataupun sebenarnya pernah ada masalah lain. Sebab kita tak tahu dia ni new case ataupun a complicated case. Uh, so, kalau new case macam kita tahu dah dia ni tak pernah buat investigation apa semua. So, just senang sikit and uh, basically uh, the easy lah. Tapi kalau dia pernah ada sebelum ni so maybe macam contoh nephrotic mungkin dah relapse apa semua so it might be complicated. So macam awal-awal tu dah tanya dah uh, anak ni kali pertama ke ataupun dah pernah datang dah sebelum ni sebab masalah yang sama. Uh, so boleh tanya macam tu dekat patient. Uh, so just ni general idea lah. So this is the case. Um, so this one I take uh, from online lah. Uh, korang boleh check juga. Uh, nanti I ada, I dah pergi link kat tempat tu memang banyak sangat contoh-contoh case yang menarik, pet case. So just uh, boleh cari online je case-case yang menarik untuk you guys tengok macam mana dia go through every symptom semua tu. So yang ni uh, is a patient Jeffrey, uh, 18 month old, male boy. Uh, and then uh, they presented with generalized swelling. So the HOPI, uh, when the fathers noticed two days ago, there's a swelling around his eye. So kita uh, kita tengok sama-sama eh. So swelling around his eye. So apa yang apa yang kita dapat dari sini, patient ada dapat peri orbital edema. It might peri orbital edema. Okay. So kita translate kan uh, ada input semua based on our uh, kita panggil clinical significance. Uh, so and then uh, then the same day Jeffrey mother noticed that his sock has left imprint in his ankle. So apa dia nak cakap kat sini? Saya boleh bagi idea. Apa apa nak cakap sini ada kesan imprint ni? Apa nak cakap kat sini? Anyone? Pitten edema. Yes, they want to say about pitten edema. So maybe patient tak akan cakap straight kan uh, anak saya datang dengan fruity uri, anak saya datang dengan ascites. No, but kita yang kena uh, translate it into our clinical significance lah. So this is pitten edema. Okay, and then uh, they think he might have gained some weight so may not show that it's very edematous uh, sampai boleh gain weight uh, okay and then uh, has been irritable over the past few days so irritable ni maybe the child is sick uh, so this want to say that person person dah sick dah sebelum tu and very uh, apa, uh, uh, ill condition kan sebab you know pediatric patient they cannot say that they are sick but they show their behavior. So this is very important lah. And then uh, the dietary, his intake of food water has been normal over the period but uh, he has been peeing much less frequently. So this one to say there is a problem in the urine. Tapi tak cakap straight directly for the urine ke, it might be oligoria. So maksudnya kat sini kita still kena fikir maybe ada uh, um, apa sama ada nephrotic ataupun nephrotic kan. Uh, okay. So and then about one week ago Jeffrey had a cold. So yang ni sangat-sangat important untuk kita tanya pasal history of sick uh, period. Sebab dua-dua in nephrotic also in nephritic uh, usually dia punya uh, clinical consequences tu mesti ada history of uh, sick ataupun infection ke sebab dia orang ada uh, this theory of uh, immune system. Uh, okay, so uh, kena tanya lah pasal sick period before this and then bawah tu kita okay, ada masalah. So uh, tadi dah tanya pasal past medical history, uh, family history and then uh, any medication. So maybe uh, drugs pun also can cause a secondary cause of nephrotic syndrome. Ada uh, allergic tadi uh, macam uh, siapa? Nadira cakap tadi kan? Uh, maybe ada anaphylactic uh, tapi patient sebenarnya tak ada non allergies ke apa and immunization is up to date okay so these are very quite straightforward uh, how to uh, if you want to clock the history in this nephrotic syndrome lah sebab so, korang kalau kita orang macam dulu bagi 10 minutes je untuk clock kan kalau modified so kena macam very uh, apa straightforward and kena targeted lah targeted history Okay, so what findings on the physical examination? Okay, 
So yang ni uh, basically uh, macam mana kita nak assess this patient. Okay. And uh, take the try. Nak, 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 nak try tak? Apa yang kita nak cari dalam physical examination? Uh, boys lah boys. Cik, brothers. Boleh tak? Anyone? Siapa yang ada? Ada dua orang je? Eh, ke saya tak nampak semua? Ibrahim or Lutfil Hadi? Cik Alif. Cik Alif? Lelaki juga kan? Okay, ada nak try tak? Ke tengah minum air tu? Okay, kalau tak ada, kita cuba ada lain lah. Siapa lagi nak try? Siapa ni sharing je. Uh, if you try now, uh, you have more benefits. Uh, you will uh, remember and it will help you much in your clinical uh, examination nanti. Okay, ada sesiapa nak try? Ada ke? Kena nak panggil je. Okay, nak buka ni. Okay. Siapa uh, Ani Sofia nak try? Komiti. Siapa komiti boleh try juga. Atau tak Ani sedia Anis? Ada ke? Saya try doktor. Ah okey. Siapa ni? Cik Cik Alif. Panggil Alif ke Cik? Alif. Alright. Okay. Give okay. it try. Yeah. Uh, for physical examination. Uh, first for general examination. Uh, kita, uh, first kita tengok uh, behavior of the uh, the patient lah. First. Okay. Very good. Okay. Okay. Uh, whether uh, patient tu dia irritable ke tak? So conscious hmm. ke tak? And then uh, kita tengok Uh, dari segi general uh, general examination, kita tengok uh, how the patient breathe but uh, dia boleh cause nephritic syndrome, can cause uh, apa? pleural effusion ke, pulmonary edema mm -hmm. okay, and then uh, from general examination also uh, we, we we can see uh, any, uh, because patient uh, have periobital edema so kita tengok ada periobital edema ke mm -hmm. okay. and then uh, uh, before we go to the face, uh, we go to the Uh, hand first. Uh, kita check CCTVR tadi. Ah, oh, nice one. That's one I want to hear. Okay, very good. And then, uh, and then the cut face tadi, periobita edema, uh, puffiness, mm -hmm. uh, facial puffiness, uh, evidence of the edema. And then, mm -hmm. uh, after this, uh, we go to, uh, maybe uh, kalau kita nak buat uh, chest examination pun boleh gak sebab kita kita nak uh, find any plural efficiency. Okay, good. And then uh, we go to the abdomen. Uh -huh. and then kita uh, pakai abdomen. So uh, maybe ada abdominal distension. Okay, good. Then apa lagi? Hmm. Ah, dekat chest tadi lupa. Uh, maybe kita boleh find any evidence of uh, cardiac disease. Uh, kita cari maybe uh, patient ni boleh datang dengan apa cardiac failure juga. Okay, good. Abdomen, then we go to the genital. Genital kita tengok ada tak? Uh, oh, very uh, good. Edema. edema. Okay, yes. Don't forget, then, okay? Hmm. Lepas tu, uh, we go down to the leg. Mm -hmm. Then, leg tu kita tengok ada uh, apa? Uh, edema juga. Okay, good. Very good. Uh, Cik Alif ni uh, patch mana? Avenzua. Avenzua, okay. Uh, of Evanza for you eh? Uh. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, so, uh, nampak tak saya tulis kat sini? Nampak. Okay, this is the flow yang I sempat salin. Tapi kalau tengok flow ni dah uh, very complete list of investigation. Uh, um, uh, apa? And kalau kita tengok sangat systematic. Start from general, head, hand, chest, abdomen, genital and also leg. So, this is a very a good example 
how do you want to answer uh, the finding in physics examination okey kelang kabut macam mana pun first of all keluar dalam mood adalah general examination itu jawapan paling selamat dan paling menenangkan examiner okey uh, so tu memang tips uh, ni lah so apa-apa tak salah uh, in our PMP ke in our clinical exam ke uh, first start dengan general dulu so macam pediatric sangat-sangat penting lah tengok behavior ni sebab dia uh, sick child ni memang akan present dengan irritable child apa semua and tengok dia punya basically the respiratory and also if in general examination pun kita dah nampak patient tu macam memang grossly nampak ED memang memang facial, facial perfume semua sebenarnya kita dah boleh komen awal-awal lagi and uh, satu lagi input dalam general examination ni is kita tengok dia punya kita panggil uh, site uh, site finding lah macam ada maybe ada u, uh, urine pot ke uh, okay so macam ataupun any attachments uh, macam color patient on CBD uh, macam kita boleh comment juga uh, ada amateuria ke fertility urine ke so tu semua boleh add on in general okay and satu lagi uh, in general Uh, kalau klinikal kalau sempat buat tapi dalam PMP uh, ni sangat-sangat penting which is kita nak ambil uh, heart and weight and also um, apa vital sign eh alamak, alamak tukar jawapan okay so vital sign okay kenapa heart and weight sangat penting sebab satu kita nak tengok patient ni uh, parameters dia uh, equivalent tak dengan age dia uh, sama ada dia dapat short stretch ke tak okay itu satu yang kedua sebabkan treatment Uh, bila kita nak buat steroid terapi, kita kena tahu height and weight dia baru kita boleh kira kita nak bagi berapa. Uh, so ni both uh, dua benda penting lah. So jangan lupa height and weight uh, in pediatric patient especially kalau dalam fatigue syndrome. Okay and then also vital sign. So tadi vital sign tadi uh, basically uh, uh, to be a safe doctor and juga kita nak tengok ada complication lah. So ada the rest I think uh, Cik Adif dah covered well. So kita tengok jawapan je lah Okay, so this are the answer. So we start with general and all the parameters, uh, vital sign, height and weight. So kita nak uh, tengoklah patient tu, kalau tengok uh, dia punya percentile tu, is it uh, equivalent tak dengan dia punya age? Uh, so kena plot. Uh, so and then, sebab tadi pun dah bagi hint kan, dia ada pada betul dimas, so nanti kita cari dalam uh, kita punya examination. So ini uh, tambahan for next. Uh, to set, check for cervical lift and the basically we want to know is there any uh, sign of infection uh, is it recent or current infection so uh, cardiovascular system so tengoklah if maybe it can uh, due to cardiac origins uh, macam ada heart failure academically and then pulmonary uh, system and so abdomen. So abdomen uh, plus uh, uh, kena cari juga sign of cushion of features tu macam purple stray. Uh, so semua tu kita boleh cari juga. Uh, okay and then um, so ni pun dia dah rule out any liver causes tak ada. So yang ni sangat-sangat sukalah kalau kita mention kita nak check skrotik edema. So uh, the, uh, this is a sign of gross edematous juga kan. So jangan uh, skip lah uh, kalau abdomen je kena mention tak untuk skrotik edema. And so neuro examination uh, kita just buat screening uh, sebab uh, antara region je macam azotemia pun boleh cause uh, uh, sorry steroid itself can cause psychosis and also it's severe azotemia uh, also can affect the neuro system. Okay and lastly it's leg. Alright so I think Uh, we have covered well. So macam memang uh, maybe ada benda yang tak cukup lagi in my presentation tapi at least I just want to give you a booster. Uh, actually after this you know how to study nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so that, that was my aim. So how to clock in 10 minutes. So basically you have to be targeted. You know what is important and what to uh, prioritize in your clocking. So actually we, I have a uh, script uh, jap eh yang ni macam masa kita orang tak ya lah kita orang buat tapi macam bila tengok balik uh, macam boleh lah nak apply so nanti I just share je you guys boleh check uh, tapi uh, untuk as a practice I think is good uh, to have this type of uh, version to kita make it very concise and Uh, targeted in our uh, tracking. So uh, benda ni semua sama je kita dah uh, kita dah tengok tadi uh, dia punya ni. Nampak macam eh? Tak gerak eh? Nampak ke? 
Nampak words tak? Ke? Oh, it's kena zoom besar. Alamak, sekejap eh. Okay, okay. Okay, so yang ni, uh, ni masa tak kira macam rajin kan. Uh, tu macam dia kata lagi medik ni kena kreatif. Apa yang korang dah buat sebelum tu korang guna je. Uh, so yang ni yang uh, kita orang dah buat uh, macam clucking masa tu ya. But bila tengok balik macam very good lah untuk kita macam at least uh, symptom yang kita nak rule out masa kerja clucking tu. Okay sekarang nampak tak? Besar sikit. Uh, nampak dah betul. Okay nampak eh. So this one uh, always start with history. So uh, remember uh, your patient punya complaint is always uh, the top priority. Uh, maksudnya kena uh, jangan jangan clock uh, based on our interest ataupun our uh, preference. Tapi kita kena uh, take patient punya concern. Okay. And then go for current symptom. So current symptom tu kita rule out je how patient sebenarnya general health and go to specific uh, system, the edema system, uh, the edema status, the urinary status and also maybe other complications macam infection ke ataupun macam hypovolemia can cause abdominal pain ataupun maybe ada uh, hypertension, okay. And then go terus straight away past history, nampak tak macam terus kita nak uh, tahu ni ke simple case ke ataupun complicated case. Uh, so macam tanya je, uh, ini pertama kali ke datang, kalau dah pernah datang sebelum ni berapa kali um, and tips juga macam kadang-kadang bila dalam exam kita tak tahu patient tu on uh, which department ke apa kan. So macam uh, ada follow up kat specific klinik tak? Macam klinik nephrology ke, klinik cardiology ke. So macam benda tu kita tahu dah, uh, kita dah narrow dah. Okay case ni case nephro, case ni case cardiac okay. So macam mana setakat dia punya complication tu, ini ada problem. Okay so macam benda tu uh, korang just boleh simplify kan je. So management, so sekarang ni on management apa? ke so, kalau nak tanya pasal uh, apa macam uh, trombosis tu macam tanyalah uh, uh, ada macam sakit uh, apa sorry uh, sakit buah pinggang ke apa ke semacam so, benda tu uh, kita boleh tanya terus kat parents dia uh, ada side effect ke apa semua kan. Uh, so social history yang ni memang extra point kalau you guys include uh, to be safe uh, uh, safe doctor. So macam mana sekolah patient uh, Uh, macam mana dia punya pembelajaran financial sebab nak kena uh, keep on go to the hospital social support. So examination tadi kita dah cover uh, sama je uh, and then uh, yang ni pun lebih kurang sama uh, kalau ada benda yang tak uh, tak sesuai ke apa korang boleh omit je lah uh, and then biopsy. So ni biopsy kat sini dia lain sikit based on apa yang I present tadi. Yang ni based on when pediatric examination. So basically ambil yang Um, kalau I prefer yang ambil pediatric protocol lagi lah. So this one just nak to show je macam mana kita punya flow in 10 minutes clucking tu. Okay. So I think that's all uh, for my presentation. Uh, I think that's what I want to share with you. Sorry uh, if uh, there is lacking in my presentation and in my knowledge as well because uh, maybe there are some uh, inputs that may be a difference from your understanding but not kita learn together in the session. If there is any questions or any uh, corrections you want to uh, uh, tell and share with me, just uh, just pick it out lah. Okay. So I think that's all. I uh, hope you guys have some benefits from my presentation. And then uh, I hope you guys uh, will excel in your study and also in your examination. InsyaAllah soon all of you uh, can graduate. Um, with a good uh, Muslim doctor. I hope so. Okay. okay. Thank you uh, doctor for the sharing today and for the research also. Okay, before we end the session, I would like to see your cooperation to turn on uh, camera to see a picture with the speaker for a